I went to public high school in Denver, Colorado, at George Washington High School, and there, you know, the idea that there would have been something called art history was not in anybody's mind. I mean, there was no one in any high school that I knew in, within many states that could imagine teaching art history. And in fact, I'm like one of the many people for whom art history was going on a boring docent tour of the Denver Art Museum when I was a young kid. And didn't, I didn't really discover art history until I went to Yale and, and sat in classes with all these slides of extraordinary works of art and learned about the really great museums of the East Coast and actually handled works of art in the gallery. And I think now I, my understanding of art history, having both gotten a PhD and written boring books and been an academic art historian and then becoming a museum person. I was curator of European paintings at the Art Institute of Chicago for eight years and then I came to be the director of the DMA and built the Hammond Wing and got sick of fundraising and went into the back to the conventional world again. But l learning about the ways in which ordinary people, people like me, because I wasn't introduced to art in any kind of proper way when I was ready to be introduced to it. Um, as a young person and as an adolescent with a forming mind. And so I think it's heroic and great what you're doing and re really important because to have a student who actually knows a little bit about the history of art, be it Western or non-Western, when they come into university is really great. I, I'm teaching a course this term with Bonnie um, Wheeler for on our smartest students, the honors students, and there are 15 of them in the class. And, as I tell people, they all have IQs of 180 and they think they have IQs of 240. <laughs> and they're all in the sciences. And always my first class is, is uh, I list names of famous artists and have them raise their hand when they heard of them. And this year I started with Picasso thinking, oh, I'll make them feel comfortable. One out of 15 people raised their, one out of 15 students raised their hands. And they're all brilliant, and they're, I mean, they're like sponges, and they're full of, and now they, they do know, but it, it, it shows you that you can be really, really smart and go to really, really good schools and come all the way through and not know really very much an, of anything about the visual world in which we live, be it art or architecture. And I think that in some way, it's going to be teaching um, art and art history in the public schools and music history in the public schools and also getting art out of art history departments in universities and getting it really more broadly into the curriculum. Um, it's fantastic to have Roger Molina here because he really he has a PhD in physics and he, he, he was he learned about art and making art and thinking about art by being a human being and living around an artist and in a funny way, he has a much less hierarchical and a much less uh, academic idea of art than we do when we learn about the Egyptians and then the Greco-Roman civilization and then the Middle Ages and then the Renaissance and then the Baroque period and the Northern and Southern Baroque and da 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 and you, you know, you're asleep already just thinking about it. And it's not that it's unimportant to learn it that way, but if one can go at it in a different way, I think it's really important. I'm doing the course I'm doing with Bonnie this term for these kids. It's called Art Outside the Art Museum, and so we're visiting works of art um, in in the city in the Metroplex, none of which is in a museum. And so I'm asking them to think about art being bought and sold, art being in the on the walls of private collectors, art being on the streets, art being in corporations, art being around, art being unofficial. And in fact, there's a wonderful new book which I urge you to read by my friend Joaquin Pizarro, the great grandson of Pizarro. And I wrote my dissertation on Pizarro, so I know too much about him. But Joaquin has just finished a book um, with a great philosopher named David Carrier called Wild Art, as opposed to Tame Art. And it's artistic expression completely outside the art world. None of the works of art in this book would be dealt in by an art gallery, would be shown at an auction, would be shown in a museum, and their expressions of artistic impulse in the culture that are not art in a, in a limited way. And I really think for a lot of your students, if you look at this book, I mean, they're like sand castles and people carving food and all sorts of weird things in it. But it, what's interesting about it is how deeply felt and how varied and how fascinating these 
this wild art is and how pervasive it is in our society without us thinking about it. And in a funny way, I think it's, it is getting art a little bit outside of art history and getting art a little bit outside of the art museum that allows people um, to open up and to be able to think more broadly and to engage and experience works of art without having to worry about whether their response is correct or not. And it's not that I think it's good to know nothing. I mean, I certainly don't think that. And I, but I also know enough from my own history because I went to, uh, the reason I went to Yale is I was gonna be a biophysicist. And they had a better biophysics department than Harvard. And I got into Harvard and Yale and Columbia and, and University of Chicago and I went to Yale because of their biophysics department and I turned into an art historian. And the reason I turned into an art historian is that I'd never been exposed to works of art in a way that made me curious about them, made me want to know more about them until I went to college. And that's the key. If you can get somebody to get over that hump and being worried um, about touching something or knowing an obscure name, you know, who is Fogini? You're looking at the tomb by Piero Fogini in such and such a church and you want to say, oh my God, I've never heard of Fogini. And so how can I respond to this tomb if I don't know anything about the sculptor and if I don't know anything about bronze casting? And the more layers we put in front of people and things, the worse, the harder it is for them to have this moment of curiosity of wanting to learn more, of wanting themselves to open up to works of art. And I do, th you know, I've never thought about how to teach introduction to art history or introduction to art until I started doing it with our science students. And the, the, the depth, as it were, of their um, ignorance is so great that you can, you can start anywhere. And what I learned is that there's no right way of doing it. And different people respond to different kinds of works of art and different ways of thinking about works of art. And so if you in teaching are too rigid about the correct way of doing it, then it's not gonna work for any of it except those students who believe in that way. And art, whether it's wild or tame, is so pervasive. And in our society in which now the visual is beginning to overtake the verbal as the primary mode of communication, and when we're think, we think from devices and we look at flickering images and we send images as well as text back and forth to each other and the visual is becoming so strong in our three-dimensional world and the graphic traffic which started in the 19th century where you were exposed to multiples and prints and photographs is now completely crazed by the digital world in which we live. And what we have to teach people is that this large, chaotic, ever-changing, fabulous world contains an enormous amount of inspiration and many ideas, and that art is not about art. Art is about life. It's about living. It's about the way in which we act in the world, and art is everywhere. So if one can get out of those awful, docent tours of museums, and one can get out of the movements and get out of the periods that kind of put works of art into places where they don't really need to be um, in order for people to understand them better. That's really important. So I am, in a terrible way, believe in art, and I believe in art history, but I believe art history should be nonlinear. I believe it should be multimedia and definitely multicultural that one has to le learn to evaluate uh, Maya stela as well as a Greek pot or a Egyptian sculpture, that one has to think very deeply about art across culture. And I was thinking the other day, I was looking at, I was in the Fair Park with my students and looking at a mural in one of the rooms in the Hall of State, and it had a bunch of things going on, but there were two art books in the mural, and one of them was the history of art by whoever wrote the history of art in 1936, and the other was Art as Experience by John Dewey. And I'm sure most of you have read that book, but if you haven't read it, you should. Because I think in, as I remember reading it when I was about 14, 
and I remember rereading it when I was thinking about the Barnes Foundation, and I remember reading a copy when I was studying for a while at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, the copy that belonged to Alfred Einstein. And Einstein read and wrote in German in the, in the, the, the margins of this book a, a whole series of responses because Dewey was a person who believed that art is not only to be experienced, but is in itself embodied experience. And his utterly American and utterly non-chronological book about art is, I think, the most important American book about art ever written. And it's a book that you know, was written a long time ago. And to be able to say that it's still worth reading is really important. And that old works of art are still worth looking at is important. And the thing I want to end with is something that I believe very fervently, which is that all art is contemporary. When you look at a painting by Michelangelo, or a Coptic tomb cover, or a sculpture of Hatshepsut, or whatever it is, you're looking at it now, and you're looking at it in real space. And though it speaks to you of the civilization and the culture that produced it, it, produ it speaks to you now, and it speaks to you. So the important thing is to make that synapse between the work of art from whatever remote past it comes and uh, me, us, in the present. That's what the history of art should be. It should be about making the past present through art. So that's my little speech, and I've got to go to the goddamn dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> and I, have I overdone my time? <laughs> And I don't know anything about being an art critic, so you have to be, if you read the Dallas Morning News in the next few months, cut me some slack. <laughs>